Hello and welcome to Green Homes and Bacon. And in this week's episode, I show you through another amazing home on the shores of Lake Weber in Nooseville and share a bite or two with its owners while Lee meets up with the developer of an eco-industrial estate that is perhaps the only one like it in Australia, if not the world. And we get to share his vision and wisdom. You're watching Green Homes and Bacon. Nooseville is located just inland along the northern tip of Queensland's Sunshine Coast and is the neighbour of its more well-known holiday destination, Noosa. The area boasts a rich hinterland and is a mecca for tourists seeking its sun-drenched beaches, waterways, national parks and, of course, its shopping and dining. But it's alongside the shores of Lake Weber that we'll find our feature home and its wonderfully inviting owners, Joe and Karen Schlegeris. And this is their green home. And as we sit down to some local fresh fruits and home-cooked goodies, I started out by asking just how environmentally conscious, or green, they actually are. Dark. Very dark. <laughs> Karen? You're a dark, dark yeah. green. Um, well, that comes out, Joe, I think. But you, yeah, you, you these know. words. Look, we're sort of middle class hippies, really. <laughs> I don't know. We're, we're thoughtful about it. You think you're dark green, do you? Well, in that it's, I put its importance above all, all other considerations, yeah. Do you? Hmm. Yeah. Now, Joe and Karen have only recently moved here from a so called 17 hot years in Townsville. Yeah, but why come here to the Noosa region? I just, there's, only, there's only a couple of places on the whole east coast of Australia that have, you know, a perfect north-facing beach protected from bad southern winds. You know, there's, there's here, there's Palm Beach in Sydney, there's, what, 1776, but that's 10,000 miles from nowhere. Yeah. So this was pretty much the only, 1770, that's right. <laughs> But there were lots of um, lots of criteria, I suppose. Joe wanted to be on the flat so he could ride his bike everywhere. He wanted to be able to walk in the national park. He wanted to be able to swim in the ocean uh, and not be afraid of stingers um, because we didn't s swim in the ocean anymore in Townsville. He wanted James to be able to ride his bike to school and for everything to be close and local. And if, if we needed milk, ride the bike. So that's the sort of lifestyle we have. I don't ride my bike so much, but the boys mm ride a lot, send them off on their bike for the milk and bread and... Um, and it, you know, and it's worked great. out. I mean, I probably only use my car every second day. So, you know, I think about half of all days it doesn't move. And that was, you know, part of the plan was to not have to use a car to do every little thing. You know, we looked farther up in the hills because, you know, we wanted to have chickens and all that. So we thought it might be nice to be a little bit more remote. But I just said, no, I don't want every little errand to be a 20 minute drive. I want to be able to knock off most things without using the car. Yeah. So, and was your original prospect to build, or was that...? No, absolutely not. No, we, we, we tried desperately to find an existing house to buy. A, because we didn't want to go through the, you know, the, the process of building. And B, because, you know, the greenest house you can build is one you don't build at all, you know, if there's something already sitting there. But we looked at dozens and dozens and dozens of houses, all of which were built in a way, structurally and inescapably, that you, they would waste so much energy and you just couldn't fix them. So most of them, unless they happen to get knocked down, you know, can't really be improved very much. So, um, you know, I think you have to always acknowledge that building houses is an indulgence and there's nothing about building that's ever green, but given you accept that, then you just did the best we could. Building your new home, was that always going to be a green home? It was, absolutely. I was, I was implacable on that point and it is as as carefully designed as possible from the top to the very bottom. So the, the bottom is screw piles, so we managed not to use 375 tons of concrete that otherwise would have been required for the foundation. The roof, you will have noticed, is perfectly north facing. You know, not, not close, it's, it's perfect, which because it's a bit skewed to the, the, the cardinal directions here, um, it's determined the shape of the whole house, which I think has worked out particularly well. So, and every, everything in between is, um, you know, is, is chosen to, to have as little impact as you can. The main structure is uh, cypress pine, which is native here in southeast Queensland, grows here. Um, 
and is otherwise treated by farmers as sort of a nuisance. So by actually using it as a product, you're encouraging them to, to keep it there. Uh, the, all the floor is um, recycled black butt, so it's served as floors somewhere else for 40 or 50 years before here. So, um, and you know, in terms of energy consumption, we've, we've really delivered the goods. We um, draw, oh, over 10 months we've been here so far, we've drawn less than four kilowatts a day kilowatt hours a day from the from the grid so that's about one-fifth of a normal one-person household um, so you know we've we've done that part I, I want to go and go on and do the rest and take it to zero but presently we've got access to the feed-in tariff so for as long as that goes we'll uh, we'll run with that yeah because you've got a massive 10 kilowatt system yeah. It, it, but everyone wants to call it massive or huge it's not massive or huge it's just the right size it fits on the roof and it fits the function intended, you know, and you should see a lot more of those in a lot more neighborhoods. Not everyone has a roof that's suitable for that. Ours could take care of three or four or five houses around here, and that's you know the way it ought to be. It's not it's not huge. It's right. Well, my comparison is simply yeah. to probably what is average in Australia, yeah. which is probably closer to two kilowatts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need about the average house I think consumes 25 kilowatts a day. Yeah, we get about five to six hours sun on average per day. Mm -hmm. for the year in Queensland. So you're producing a, arguably 50 or 60 kilowatts oh, per yeah. day. Oh we're, yeah, we're producing a, a big surplus. Yes. And, and that's by design. And that's geared toward moving to the next stage, which is going off grid, which I think people here in the ordinary suburbs will need to do a lot sooner than they think because the regulators and the industries are, are presently conspiring to, to make electricity more like water. Um, you know, last quarter our water bill was $260. If we had used zero water, the bill would have been 240. So only that much was for the water we actually consumed. Yeah. The rest, maybe fairly, maybe not, was for the infrastructure of having, you know, pipelines and treatment plants and pumping stations and, and all that. Um, because the state government is so committed to keeping the old-fashioned electrical grid working and profitable, they're moving toward that. So the cost of the electricity you consume is going to become quite small and the cost of having a connection at all is going to become the vast proportion of your bill. Did you You're watching Green Homes and Bacon. So coming back to collecting or harnessing your own solar, mm. so that means we're going to have to get more into a storage uh, yeah. environment? Yeah, but storage is going to be easy. I mean, you look at it, the, the cost of generating solar electricity has fallen by 80 or 90 percent in the last few years. It's, it's almost free now. I mean, if you buy your electricity from uh, Energex or AGL as we do, we pay 25 cents a kilowatt hour. If you assume our system only lasts 10 years, then our cost is 5 cents a kilowatt hour. So it's cheap to produce it. Um, and I think storage is going to race down that cost curve just yes. the way production did. And so this year, calendar 2013, you'll find it's, it's going to be cheaper to generate it, store it, and run your own than it will be to buy it for 25 cents. Yeah. And that's why you see the regulators and the, the industry scrambling to make sure that hasn't happened because, you know, for big users it's obvious. People in the suburbs tend to be thinking four or five years behind reality. But the fact is now, even though batteries are still kind of expensive, not everyone says batteries are way too expensive. They're not. They're kind of expensive now. When the price drops by half again, then it'll be slam dunk obvious that it's cheaper to get off the grid, not be subject to the pricing changes you're going to see there. And then you'll have fixed your your you know your supply forever. Yes. Yeah. So here we are, normal people. We're not we're not hippies. We like to buy organic if we can, and we like to eat healthy food, and we think about our lifestyle. But we've moved here, and we've chosen a lifestyle, and we've thought about what sort of work we want to do, and how we want to be in the world. So it's it's been good. We've we've been able to start from scratch. Uh, with the house and with our lifestyle. But we're fairly normal people, and I don't think if people just met us, they would think we're hippie, but as soon as we start talking about different choices we make, that would probably sneak in. Your so, cooking's good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, cooking's an interesting topic because the kitchen is, is, is the root of all evil, in, in, as far as I can tell. <laughs> well, because the average kitchen... This is, this is gonna be interesting. The, av the average <laughs> kitchen has, you know, six, eight, ten, fifteen devices which are designed to draw power all the time. And 
all of it's useless and wasted and just makes your kitchen hotter, which is not what you're after in the summer. Yeah. The, the classic example is the microwave. You know, we use a microwave normally like everybody else. Um, maybe it's on 10 minutes a day and it draws 800 watts when it's running or something like that. But most microwaves are set up to be plugged in and turned on and stay that way. In fact, they get built into these little cubbies with the power point in back, which you can't even get to. Well, I just did the quick calculation. On that basis, cooking normally, way over 90% of the electricity is consumed, is consumed when it's not doing anything. It's to have the dumb thing sitting there in case you press the button and showing you that little clock, which disagrees with all the other digital clocks in the kitchen and just drives <laughs> you nuts. And every device is like that. We have a gas range, but except for my interference, it would draw electric current all the time because the sparker is there waiting just in case you turn the knob to turn it on. You know, another 15 watts constantly, 25 bucks a year to sit there just in case. The oven, you know, it's got a clock in it. Um, you know, so we've got in our cupboard there in the kitchen a set of four switches that control the range hood, the, the cooktop, the microwave and the oven and we just turn them all off and they're all off except when you're actually using them and that you know doesn't cost us anything we cook just as much as anybody else we use the range hood and the vent fan just as much as anybody else we get all the utility that those things provide and we use about 80 or 90 percent less electricity you know it's not it's not like changing a light bulb and, and saving 10 or 20 percent here and there you know just changing behavior at no cost can reduce your electricity waste by you know those sorts of proportions by more than half and it's you know it, it, I'm always so disappointed <laughs> that people don't just do the obvious things oh no because you have chickens yeah I've got our chooks <clears throat> chooks are heroes Chook, <laughs> chooks they're absolute heroes because we have no wet garbage so nothing stinky nothing hard to deal with they just process it all and things they don't eat they scratch around till they disappear and they make eggs out of it and they produce fertilizer for us they're you know they are the absolute heroes of the suburbs and you know you don't have to have them at every house in our in a previous house the, you know, the lady next door brought her scraps over so we had two houses worth being being processed uh, but they're just absolutely magnificent creatures Champions. having chickens does that change your diet at all like having yeah, just, a you, product that people would commonly eat. and might just buy fewer eggs, but no, I don't think we eat any, I don't think we eat a different number of eggs, we just don't have to buy very many. I don't mean well, eggs. Well, that's eggs, I mean, no. I mean, oh, so if, we, no, if I pets. buy organic or free-range chicken, <coughs> we have to call it fish. Mm. Fish. Yes, because we don't like the idea of eating chicken, particularly James, our son. He's not keen on the idea of us eating mm. chicken. So we're having fish curry for dinner. <laughs> 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 Going back to your old home in Townsville, you mm. did have a swimming pool, didn't you? Mm. Mm. What happened to that? Well, oh, that was that was a triumph. It was a <laughs> it was a huge old-fashioned <clears throat> swimming pool. It was at least ninety thousand liters, maybe more. Um, and uh, I just resented it. You know, even though we had kids, my experience was kids aren't interested in going swimming in the pool at home. You know, people have this grand vision: oh, it'd be great to have a pool for the kids. I think, well, in some cases, in some families, that's probably true. But in our case, what it worked out to over 10 years was a cost of at least $100 per person swim and an environmental cost that was equivalent to having two extra cars follow me everywhere I went for 10 years. The carbon footprint of the pool was absolutely enormous and it was at least twice that of, of, a, of a car. Um, so one pending wet season I said that's it, just drained it siphoned it out, didn't even have to pump it out because we were on a hill, so I was able to siphon it out. And uh, we luckily had some huge rainstorms and I managed to fill it in just two storms with fresh water and popped in some plants and popped in some freshwater native fish, some little rainbows, and let them go. I think I put six fish in and a few months later we had you know, probably a thousand. Um, and it was absolutely beautiful and all of a sudden there was a reason to go down there. The water was green sometimes a little bit brown, but, but mainly greenish. Um, and the fish were happy, and if you dangled your legs in the pool, they'd nibble on your skin. And, and uh, all of a sudden, this place where nobody went except me, having to maintain the stupid pool, which if it didn't look pristine blue, looked awful. All of a sudden, it was beautiful and had plants coming out of it. It smelled nice. The water you know, wasn't full of poison, which you, you know, used to try to keep it sterile. Instead, it was full of life and used that to water the plants. And it was absolutely magnificent. And it was heartbreaking when we went 
to sell the house because we had to turn it back into a, a sterile, dead wasteland of a pool. Um, so anyway, it's back there. I don't know what the current owner is doing, but I suspect he's wasting 20 or 25 kilowatt hours a day trying desperately to keep a body of water out in the open in the tropics sterile and dead. You can't do it. You know? <laughs> uh, but he's <laughs> devoting heaven knows what in terms of chemicals and electricity trying to do that. Getting back to your house again then. Uh, yes. <laughs> what are the areas you tend to relax and where do you probably spend most of your time? Your relaxation time. Yes. Well, we're always at the kitchen bench because everything happens in yes. the kitchen. It's a great because it's a great central island, isn't it? Yeah. I guess per, did, was that your idea? Was it something you'd seen or come across? No. Well, Karen was adamant that she didn't want all her mess around the sink to be visible from the front door, and so instead of building a little privacy barrier or something, the architect came with the idea about how about making the bench just that much higher than than the bench top, and um, does the trick. Oversized breakfast bar. Yes, I guess, that's isn't right. it? Yeah, everyone always loves a breakfast bar. Yeah. And, and it's a little, it's a little high because we wanted the the benches themselves to be high because kind of bending down for benches that are too low, you really notice it when we go elsewhere now. So the benches are nice and high. So when you raise something high above the high benches, it, it ends up being pretty tall. This deck is beautiful, and our swimming pool there. Yes. Is my very favourite. It's beautiful sitting out here, and we um. We built this part of the house in so that the cold winds coming this way wouldn't uh, would keep the balcony protected. It's beautiful, a lovely spot out here. And then the other open spot uh, is designed to catch the heat, so that's the spot to be in the winter because that's all nice and warm. And the rumpus rooms comfortable down here at the dining table because you've got the view and you look out at the water in the morning. And the backyard, Joe lives in the backyard talking to his plants and his chooks. James jumps on the trampoline. And our bedroom's nice. It's in calm up there, it's like being in a tree house. And I love my office. <laughs> we love all the space, I love my bathroom. And of course you've got down the hallway, uh, what do you call it? Our loft. The loft? Yes, yes. On cold days we go into the loft with yes. James and play Monopoly. Yeah, that's incredible. Piece yeah. of art. watching Green Homes and Bacon. I'm here just south of Brisbane visiting an awesome eco-industrial estate where I'm just about to have a bit of a chat with the award-winning developer. Owner and developer of the Mitchell Eco-Industrial Estate is Bruce Mitchell and it's fair to say that Bruce is somewhat of a pioneer and an environmental rationalist that this world needs more of. And Lee starts out by asking Bruce what has driven his award-winning environmental initiatives and his clean, green and smart way of thinking. Well, I've developed over the last 20 years. I think there's too much waste in the world. And I'm driven about uh, having the motto, and that is uh, clean up your own backyard. What I've done here is to demonstrate that you don't have to have waste as much as what's around. And it's very frustrating to see people throwing their cans and bottles away and like these sheds are all being recycled. The sheds weren't thrown away. They were salvaged. I pulled them apart and moved them here to try and save the steel and the work that gone into this. One of the sheds is just magnificent. The architecture in the shed, you just can't get that today. It's beautiful to look at. So tell me, why green up an industrial estate? Well, most people's philosophies are the same. I had a value come here for the for the bank, and he looked at this lake and said, uh, why have you wasted this land? I could put another shed here. 
and that's the thinking and it's, a, it's very, very frustrating. Uh, it's lovely to be able to come to work, enjoy the barbecue, the lake and the bird life here and quite a few of the staff walk around the estate. Go to another estate down the road, it's all concrete. Mm -hmm. And they spend one third of their life at work. It is amazing, you hear the birds here. Uh, why not enjoy that uh, environment that I've created? Yeah, Bruce, it makes, actually just sounds like it makes really, really good sense. Is that yeah. the way you see it? Yes. Yes. I, I've been lucky enough, I come from a hard working background, but I've been lucky enough to be able to have uh, around me an environment from, from my marriage, day, marriage <laughs> days. And I've always found a property that I could develop and have this sort of environment. Well, that's just fantastic and it's just beautiful to be here. Yeah. Um, so tell me though, what were some of the challenges that you faced when building this estate? Well, There would have been a few. The real estate agents down the road laughed their head off. They okay. Said, uh, there's a mug just gone and bought the property down at Quinn's Hill Road. It's got a 38 metre fall between the road and the... And so you're the mug? I'm the mug. <laughs> 38 metre fall to the, to the creek. I've created a bigger lake than was here, and another 38 metres to get up the other. You couldn't possibly put sheds on this estate. You have to use flat land or close to flat. And I've proved them all wrong. And uh, I rang the agent up and said, I'm looking about, I'm looking about buying a block, mentioning this one. And he laughed his head off. He said, it's goat country. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd already put, bought it by then. and. Uh, the first 15 or 18 months before I started developing the property, I put a cut in where Shed 3 is, and we hit all this quartz. Mm. So I got to dump it along, the, along here, and I, I spent 15 months. I laid 300 tonne of stone, and I built all the creeks all by hand. So I took it through the Mataluka area, and I wouldn't allow any machines to get in there to destroy the Mataluka, so I had to do it all by hand. And it got me really fit. I started when I was 66, so Mm -hmm. to lay that not many people believe that a man of my age would go about laying 300 tonne of stone. But it's all done with love and care, and it shows. And uh, the purpose of that was to be able to take the water out of the lake and put it upstream. It's all driven by solar power. So the water would then find its way through the lake, going over waterfalls, collecting the oxygen, and put the oxygen back in the lake, which improved the lake by improving the, the bird life and the fish life and remove the majority of the mosquitoes. So it was a purpose. It was a, it was a purpose in doing it. Not only does it look nice to have a creek running through the estate, it's lovely, but it also um, helps to put oxygen back into the lake. And, Which uh, helps the fish. Helps the fish, and I, I've actually, in fact, been asked by other developers to improve their lakes. Okay. So what is it that Bruce has really created? Well, typical of any industrial precinct or estate are heavy industry activities that include a lot of concrete, steel, noise and grunt, and are mostly unattractive and very unenvironmental. And so Bruce quite masterfully has built a green jungle around and through his concrete jungle. Yes, this industrial park is surrounded and intertwined with bushlands, gardens, waterways, and with its own central lake area and thriving ecosystem. But it's more than just a cleverly created natural environment. Each factory, or shed as Bruce calls them, have been built from recycled construction materials. They are totally self-sufficient using solar power, capturing their own water, and the whole estate processes its own sewage. It's a win for the environment, it's a win for the businesses, and it's a win for the workers. Good on you, Bruce. Let's hope your model is the start of a new way to design and enjoy the industrial workplace. Well, that's it for tonight's episode. You can see more online at greenhomesandbacon.com.au or the Green Homes and Bacon Facebook page. Special thanks to our Nooseville feature homeowners, Joe and Karen Shigeris, and of course, Bruce Mitchell, and our program sponsor, Queensland Country Credit Union. See you all next week, same time, same place. Thanks for watching. One more time.